himself, then he can start the session. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this morning or afternoon or evening, depending on what time zone people are in, about our experiences here in Seattle uh, managing children with uh, COVID-19 and the impact on our uh, health system and our population. So um, uh, can everyone see my screen? Is it sharing properly? Um, we, we can see your screen. Thank you. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna uh, do a, uh, this with some case-based examples of our emerging strategies for pediatric COVID-19 management with a little bit of examples of our uh, approach to diagnosis, testing, and isolation of children. Uh, some examples of uh, varying severities of COVID-19 uh, pneumonia and lung disease uh, with some specific uh, discussion of uh, oxygen uh, therapy delivery options, medication management, and then briefly about intubation and resuscitation uh, strategies for safely managing those children. Uh, I'll speak a little bit about this uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome of children and the diagnosis and treatment and our approach to that. And then also some examples of uh, COVID-19 in the newborn of a COVID positive mother. And then also uh, speak a little bit to future challenges in pediatric COVID management. Uh, so our program goals, we've developed a comprehensive multidisciplinary program in Seattle for managing COVID-19 and its impact on our hospital and pediatric community. And the goals are to provide effective care to all pediatric inpatients and outpatients, uh, mostly those without COVID-19 as it remains relatively rare in the pediatric population. We want to ensure staff, patient, and visitor safety in all our healthcare settings. And we also have the uh, important goal of conserving uh, personal protective equipment for our, uh, our staff involved in caring for patients. So our program uh, specifically in those goals uh, to provide effective care, we've developed care protocols for COVID-19 suspected and positive patients. We're doing routine testing of all surgical patients and inpatient admissions. Early on in the COVID pandemic, we did not have very good access to testing. That is much improved and has greatly facilitated our ability to manage the safety of our environments. And we have special isolation protocols for patients with suspected COVID or known COVID-19 or known COVID exposure. And to ensure our patient, staff, and visitor safety, we have um, symptom surveillance at all our hospital and clinic entrances of anyone who's coming into one of our healthcare environments. Uh, we've had limited visitation policies for our patients. This unfortunately presents a great deal of stress on the families and um, children that don't have to, or that aren't able to have as many visitors as normal. And we've gone to universal masking uh, across all our uh, healthcare environments in uh, clinics, inpatient and outpatient settings. And to conserve PPE, we are uh, using strategies of extended mask use with face shields and reusable goggles so that we can decrease the number of masks that individual care team members use in a day. Uh, we are using uh, CAPR PAPR, so air purifying respirators when possible to reduce N95 mask use. We've had significant shortage of N95 masks. And we're using laundered gowns uh, instead of disposable gowns when possible for um, uh, protection of our staff. So I'm going to use a few cases to illustrate how we've implemented some of this program. Uh, this is a, a case from very early in the uh, epidemic and in, in the second week of March, uh, when uh, this is only two weeks after the first case was identified in the Seattle area. Uh, so a 16-year-old girl uh, had chief complaint of fever and cough and she had known sick contacts to uh, family members with respiratory illness. She was seen in an urgent care, was alert, tachycardic, but otherwise unremarkable exam. She had some labs sent and a COVID swab was sent. Uh, at that time, we were looking at two to three days turnaround time for testing of COVID-19. She was uh, dehydrated appearing, so was uh, given an IV fluid bolus and discharged. She returned the next day to the emergency department with a Chief complaint of persistent fever, cough, rhinorrhea, significant shortness of breath, dizziness, and persistent tachycardia. Her mother had been monitoring her heart rate at home and it was in the 150s. She had a chest x-ray which showed streaky left infiltrate. And because of concern for the shortness of breath, 
she had a chest CT done to evaluate for the possibility of pulmonary embolism. This was negative for pulmonary embolism, but was noted to identify a uh, left lower lobe uh, retrocardiac uh, pneumonia. Now, CT scan is not routinely recommended for the evaluation of children uh, with uh, suspected uh, uh, COVID infection. And in this case, it was done to evaluate for pulmonary embolism. So she uh, was admitted to our special infection unit for observation IV hydration ceftriaxone. So she qualified in this category of patient under investigation. Uh, at that time, we are identifying patients under investigation as children with respiratory disease with a known COVID uh, contact or otherwise high risk situation, which we defined as close contact with a known positive case of COVID-19. Now at that time in mid-March, we had very little testing. So there was very little known positive exposure. Recent travel to a location with high level of SARS-CoV-2 transmission. So at that time, that, that was travel to uh, Italy, Spain, uh, or uh, China. Uh, in Seattle, we were starting to see an increasing number of uh, cases in the adult population. And then residents in an institution with a cluster of COVID-19-like illness. At that time, in Washington State, there were several outbreaks in, in nursing homes. Now, that did not uh, involve very much pediatric exposure, but these were the public health department case definitions. We also were considering children to be a patient under investigation if they had severe respiratory disease without an alternate explanation. So if they had fever and cough, shortness of breath, and pneumonia on chest x-ray, uh, and they had no other alternate reasonable explanations such as influenza. Now this was mid-March, so we were still in flu season and respiratory viral illness season at that time. So the likelihood of a child having a viral cause of their respiratory illness was still quite high. And we've subsequently added, uh, this was not known in March, but patients being assessed for the MISC syndrome. So our special infection unit, uh, we and several other hospitals have designated areas of the hospital for managing patients with suspected or known COVID disease. Uh, we've identified area with uh, beds that have negative pressure airflow capabilities. Uh, these units are separated out with limited entrance and exit points to reduce provider and staff traffic in and out of patient rooms and through the unit, and they have significantly restricted visitor policies. Uh, importantly, we have trained our staff who are working in these areas with special isolation training. This is a picture showing an example of a training session in which people are wearing cap or helmets, PPE, and are practicing uh, respiratory support resuscitation using special isolation practices. We are using pathogen specific PPE, generally following Centers for Disease Control uh, recommendations. So airborne strict isolation precautions with the consideration that COVID is likely spread through air. Uh, CAPR, the continuous air purifying respirators when we are able uh, we're trying to limit N95 use since we have shortage of those masks. This is an example of the fabric gown with full front and back coverage. Long cuff gloves to cover the gap between the gown and the glove. Scrub bottom short sleeve shirt so that people are wearing hospital specific uh, laundered uh, scrub gear. And then importantly, observe donning and doffing of the PPE so that we ensure that people going into the room are appropriately covered and protected. And when people come out, that they remove their PPE without contaminating themselves or the environment. In the uh, special infection unit and also in our emergency department and in our pediatric ICU SIU beds, we are using telemedicine from, uh, for communication in and outside the room. We have a camera or an iPad focused on the patient with an external laptop to allow communication with also visualization of the patient to minimize uh, people going into the room. We have a speaker in the room on the patient bed so we can hear the patient and communicate with the patient or family members or staff in the room. Uh, as mentioned, we have an observation nurse to assist with donning and doffing PPE. We have a, a table where we have equipment placed so we don't need to pass directly into the room. We have stuff already in there. And that includes resuscitation 
bags that are using special HEPA filters so that when we are bagging patients and doing, if we would need to bag a patient, we would not be further aerosolizing into the room the uh, secretions or um, mucus. And then also having appropriate access to our uh, protective uh, PPE respiratory protection for our staff. This is a kind of a schematic of the system. Uh, if we were to do an emergent intubation, we would have minimum number of people in there, an anesthesiologist or intensive care provider with airway skills, a nurse or respiratory therapist to assist, and then other uh, staff members outside the room communicating for uh, need for supplies or medications or other support with minimizing the number of people that go into the room. This has the goals of providing resuscitation for the patient, protecting the medical staff from exposure to infection, and reducing PPE consumption. We are focusing on reducing number of responders in the room using telemedicine and then this safe transfer equipment and then continually monitoring for PPE breach. So to get back to our case of this 16-year-old girl, uh, she was admitted to the hospital. Two days later, her COVID-19 swab came back positive. She was still febrile but feeling better, and she was discharged on oral antibiotics to cover for possible bacterial and super infection. So this uh, now leads us to discussion of how should we treat our children that have COVID lung disease. Uh, most of our patients have been negative. Uh, despite the high prevalence of COVID-19 in the community at times in, in our area, it had been very high in March and April, decreased in May, and unfortunately is starting to increase again in late June and into July. Our positive tests of children with symptoms have shown a positive rate of only approximately 2%. We've tested, uh, as of a few days ago, nearly 3,000 uh, patients who had some amount of respiratory symptoms. And then we've also tested uh, a large number of asymptomatic patients. We are testing all admissions to the hospital and we are doing testing on all preoperative patients. We are very fortunate now to have access to uh, uh, a high amount of testing so we can do a lot of surveillance uh, screening of these patients to minimize uh, risk of somebody being in our care setting without knowing their COVID status. Interestingly, when we look at, this, at the uh, percentage of the uh, tests that are positive, we look at what symptoms were present in those kids who are positive, we find that asymptomatic is a high percentage. So the majority of asymptomatic patients are negative. Almost everybody with no symptoms does not have COVID, but among those with COVID positive tests, about 27% have been positive. And this is consistent with what we're seeing in the literature in adult patients in various different studies showing anywhere from 20 to 40% of positive people may be asymptomatic at the time of testing. Fever and respiratory symptoms are the overwhelmingly uh, most common symptoms amongst those who are positive with a smaller percentage showing headache, diarrhea, uh, and other gastrointestinal symptoms. Loss of smell, which has been noted to be present in uh, COVID, was present in a small number of our patients. This may be low in part because many of our younger patients may not be able to reliably report that symptom. This is an example of a case of more severe lung disease. Uh, this is a case of a 16-year-old obese female, otherwise healthy. Uh, she presented with four-day history of daily fevers, worsening respiratory distress, abdominal and chest pain, nausea and vomiting. She did have diarrhea, headache, and myalgia. So she had virtually every one of the potential symptoms that might be seen with COVID disease. She was seen at a outside hospital, not children's hospital, had a PCR test that was positive. She presented in June. Now that testing is more widely available with faster turnaround times, we are seeing children referred to us that have testing already done. So she was transferred to our pediatric intensive care for management of her respiratory distress. This shows her x-ray showing significant bilateral uh, lung disease with, with uh, pulmonary infiltrates. So when we consider uh, test treatment for pneumonia, we've generated uh, a, um, a treatment algorithm. Uh, and I'm not gonna go through every line on this, but just to emphasize that what we've done is we've categorized the patients into three primary categories, mild outpatients. Uh, these are children who are not going to be admitted. They don't have any significant dyspnea or supplemental oxygen requirement. 
and we're just recommending treatment with supportive care. So oral hydration, uh, acetaminophen or ibuprofen for treatment of fever and monitoring for worsening of symptoms. Our children who are admitted with moderate disease who may require supplemental oxygen or who are dehydrated, uh, we again are recommending supportive care with IV hydration and uh, we are not typically treating them with any antiviral or investigational therapies. Our children who are severe, who are coming into the ICU, such as that prior one I just showed, who are requiring significant oxygen support or non-invasive mechanical ventilation, or who may have symptoms of sepsis or multi-organ failure, we are recommending uh, consideration for treatment with specific therapies. In this case, uh, we admitted her to the ICU we treated her with non-invasive positive pressure ventilation in the form of, of bi-level positive airway pressure or BiPAP. She was treated with remdesivir antiviral therapy for five days. We have an experimental protocol for treatment of uh, children with remdesivir. She was treated with enoxaparin for uh, thrombosis prophylaxis, and she was treated with dexamethasone. She, this, she was here in June, shortly after the reports had come out of benefit of dexamethasone in adult patients with COVID. Now, it's important for us to understand that all of these treatments and recommendations have been extrapolated from data in adult patients. There are very little, if any, prospective data studying children. There are a variety of retrospective reports on what children have been treated with, but very little linking to actual outcomes. So in this case, we are extrapolating from the recommendations in adult patients, and we've developed a uh, treatment algorithm to uh, evaluate and diagnose these patients based on severity. Again, this is a very complicated slide with a lot of information, uh, but our multidisciplinary group of infection, infectious disease, rheumatology, immunology, intensive care, emergency medicine, pediatrics, cardiology, have made recommendations for a tiered level of evaluation and uh, treatment. And um, admittedly, we are uh, still considering a lot of things and um, are still learning about what the ideal treatment uh, is for these patients. We're very important to develop outcomes data on and assessing response to therapies. Now, uh, I wanna discuss and shift to this uh, entity of multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. Uh, this uh, first uh, was being reported by people in, uh, in Europe, in the UK, uh, towards the end of April. And around that time, we had a child uh, admitted to our hospital in early May, a 13-year-old previously healthy boy who presented with a five-day history of vomiting, diarrhea, fatigue, and malaise. He was seen in an urgent care, a COVID-19 NP-PCR test was sent and he was discharged home with supportive care as he didn't look terribly ill. He subsequently developed a persistent fever and then a rash on his thighs and chest, uh, some mental status changes with hallucinations and his parents reported that he had blue nail beds and his color wasn't good. He was taken back to the emergency department. This is the next day after he had initially presented and was found to be significantly hypotensive with poor perfusion and systolic blood pressures in the 40s to 50s millimeters mercury. He had IV access obtained, fluid boluses were given. He was started on BiPAP, administered ceftriaxone, started on epinephrine infusion or adrenaline infusion for treatment of his hypotension. And he was transferred to our hospital's cardiac intensive care unit for what appeared to be cardiogenic shock. In the cardiac intensive care unit, his echocardiogram was performed, which showed decreased LV and RV function. A chest X-ray showed cardiomegaly, but with no pulmonary opacities. Uh, he had a variety of inflammatory tests sent as evaluation for his, what appeared to be hyperinflammatory syndrome. He had significant elevation of several inflammatory markers. He had a, a fairly significant lactic acidosis evidence of an acute kidney injury with a marked elevation of uh, creatinine. He was hyponatremic, had a leukocytosis. Importantly, he had two negative PCR tests for uh, COVID-19. Just around this time in early May is when we started to have antibody testing available. And so he had a antibody test sent that showed that he was positive for COVID-19. So this met the emerging diagnostic criteria for what was at the time called this pediatric multi-inflammatory syndrome or PMIS. 
which has subsequently been uh, defined by the WHO and this US CDC as MISC. Uh, this is one of the early cases that we had at Seattle Children's. Now we've had seven kids that have met diagnostic criteria for MISC. We've treated, th this young man was treated with vasopressors, inotropes, diuretics, uh, and BiPAP. He did not require intubation or mechanical ventilation. He was treated with very aggressive immune modulation. At the time, there was very little information on how or what way to treat these patients. So he was treated with IV immunoglobulin, aspirin, anakinra, and methylprednisolone, anakinra being the IL-1 blockade. He also was started on uh, anticoagulation, treated with anoxaparin as an inpatient, and was, became very weak and debilitated and ended up requiring rehabilitation and physical therapy. So the MISC syndrome uh, first identified as a case reports of association with COVID infection in April, and then subsequently uh, around the world, uh, cases reported with more refining of the um, uh, diagnostic criteria. Currently, the United States CDC uh, came up with these criteria, which were evolving and, and updated with most recently at the end of May. So they're looking uh, at children under age 21 presenting with fever, laboratory evidence of inflammation, and clinically severe illness requiring hospitalization with at least two organ systems involvement out of several organs and or, organ systems. No alternative plausible diagnoses. So they can't have diagnosed with ba bacterial sepsis or another viral infection or some other explanation for their uh, deterioration. And then there also has to be evidence of recent or uh, current SARS-CoV infection by PCR, serology, or antigen test, or exposure to a suspected or confirmed case. Initially, there was hospitalization during uh, that period when we were seeing increased cases, but now been more specifically defined as exposure within four weeks prior to onset of symptoms. Uh, these are very similar criteria, <coughs> excuse me, around the world for the diagnosis of MISC. We reported our cases uh, as part of a uh, CDC-sponsored study called Overcoming COVID-19. Uh, and this report was just uh, released uh, last week, uh, June 29, 2020, in the New England Journal of Medicine, reporting 186 children in the United States with uh, MISC uh, diagnosis. I, uh, I, four of our cases were in that 186. I uh, just want to summarize a couple uh, key findings from that paper, which is available online now. Uh, most patients, 80% had cardiovascular involvement with various uh, abnormalities uh, identified in cardiovascular system. Uh, about half of them required vasopressor support for hypotension. Almost all had echocardiograms. The uh, majority of them actually had fairly good heart function but approximately slightly over a third had, had depressed cardiovascular uh, function with lower ejection fractions. Uh, pericardial effusions or pericarditis were fairly common. BNP elevation and troponin elevation were also fairly common. In looking at other organ systems involved, gastrointestinal involvement was the most common other system uh, with, with over 90% of the children showing some form of GI involvement. Many had uh, skin rashes, uh, many had hematologic involvement, respiratory systems were also very common. Renal injury and neurological involvement were much less common. So primarily cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, respiratory, and hematologic abnormalities with, with fairly uh, common rashes. This uh, MISC had many features of Kawasaki disease, and early on, there were many patients that had uh, features of Kawasaki disease, and that is likely the source of the treatment recommendations for IVIG. In the 186 patients, again, with no defined treatment protocols and really just extrapolating from Kawasaki treatment, uh, other hyperinflammatory syndromes such as macrophage activation syndrome or similar, uh, people have been treating with a uh, variety of immunomodulatory agents. In these 186 patients, near, over three-fourths received IVIG 
patients with multiple symptom features were almost all treated with IVIG. Approximately one half of the patients were treated with systemic glucocorticoids, a smaller number with specific anti-cytokine agents, and anticoagulation was also very, uh, very common with nearly half of the patients. 80% of the patients required intensive care. In Seattle uh, Children's Hospital, all of our MISC patients have required intensive care. So we are uh, generating, this is still in development, a uh, algorithm for evaluation and treatment of these patients. And just wanna focus on a couple elements. Uh, we're using the clinical features based on the CDC uh, definitions, looking at the multi-system involvement using laboratory evaluation for evidence of significant systemic inflammation. And we're also then, um, when we have kids that are suspected, we're activating multiple uh, consults to consider how best to treat these patients. We're involving cardiology if they have abnormal echocardiograms. We're consulting our infectious disease and rheumatology uh, colleagues for evaluation for immune modulatory therapies. We are treating them with IVIG and then we're discussing or considering a variety of other, of other treatments based on the, uh, um, the clinical presentation and severity. Uh, it is common that we're treating with anoxaparin or aspirin as a uh, antithrombosis strategy, although recognizing there's very little data on thrombosis prevalence in children. Uh, I wanna shift now to another population in the last few minutes. Uh, and then we'll open for discussion and uh, uh, questions. So the, um, the situation of a newborn born, born to a known or suspected COVID positive 19 mother. Uh, as you're probably aware, there is a conflicting data on the risks to newborns uh, born to mothers who are COVID positive. Uh, some data suggests that uh, infants are not getting very uh, sick and there's minimal risk. Some other studies show that there may be uh, some babies who are infected either vertically or shortly after birth who can become quite sick. Again, very little data uh, available at this time. So I'm going to show two cases born in the same week in early April of this year who were uh, born at University of Washington Medical Center with mothers who were COVID positive. The first was born on April 4th to a 38-year-old uh, G1P1 mother who was known to be COVID positive. Uh, she had a vaginal delivery. The neonatologists were called because this baby was distressed at birth and had positive meconium. With cyanotic at delivery requiring positive pressure ventilation and then mass CPAP, APGARs were one, six, and seven. Was admitted to our neonatal intensive care unit. Initial blood gas showed significant hypercarbia. Uh, she was intubated and then a chest X-ray showed a small right pneumothorax. She improved very rapidly after intubation and was able to be extubated at 10 hours of life to room air. She was able to resume oral feeding the next day. And the family was counseled on separation options. And I'm gonna discuss what this, uh, you know, what the options are or what the possibilities are for whether the baby should stay with their mother or not. Here's another case born three days later, uh, 38 in two days, estimated gestational age, 32 year old, mother who was COVID-19 positive, but her symptoms had resolved. The father had not been tested, but was presumed positive based on symptom history. Uh, this, this mother was admitted for induced vaginal delivery for intrauterine growth, growth restriction. She was, the mother was retested, although she was asymptomatic and was still positive. And she was also counseled on isolation and separation options. So the question is to separate or not separate the infant and the mother. The US CDC says that temporary separation of the newborn from mother with confirmed or suspected COVID-19 should be strongly considered to reduce risk of transmission to the neonate. The American Academy of Pediatrics says, while difficult, the safest course is to separate mother and infant at least temporarily. Our neighbors to the north have taken a little bit of a different approach. Uh, they say that you can hold your baby skin to skin and stay in the same room as your baby if preferred. Uh, so they do not recommend routine separation. The World Health Organization has a similar approach to, to the Canadians, and they say close contact and early exclusive breastfeeding helps a baby to thrive. A woman with COVID-19 should be supported to breastfeed safely, hold her newborn skin to skin, and share a room with her baby. The Kenya Ministry of Health has, uh, I've seen, posted similar uh, recommendations to the World Health Organization. Here at University of Washington, uh, we've kind of uh, 
split the, uh, the difference. Uh, for symptomatic COVID positive women or asymptomatic COVID positive women who have not yet experienced prior disease symptoms, so those who may be pre-symptomatic, the obstetrics and pediatricians will counsel and recommend mother and baby separation following CDC and AAP guidelines. For the asymptomatic COVID positive woman, women who have experienced prior disease who may be resolving, we are allowing for co-location. Uh, they are explaining that separation is recommended, but co-location in this circumstance is aligned with WHO guidance. So in our two cases, the first one in which the child was, was uh, fairly sick, the family chose separation. The mother expressed breast milk for bottle feeding. The baby was discharged to the grandparents on day of life three and then reunited with the mother on day five uh, to start breastfeeding at home. In the first case, the family declined separation and uh, in the hospital was roomed in with the mother, was breastfed by the mother who was wearing mask. The baby was placed in isolate in the room six feet or two meters away when not feeding, had routine newborn care, was recommendation for monitoring of symptoms in the baby. The uh, infant was tested for COVID-19 per the CDC recommendations and was negative and was discharged with the mother on the day of life too. So these two examples show uh, contrasting approaches uh, to um, the issue of separation or uh, keeping the baby with the uh, mother. So in summary, our uh, pediatric COVID-19 management in Seattle, we generally follow CDC and local public health department guidelines for testing isolation. Fortunately, most pediatric cases in Seattle have been mild to moderate severity. Lung disease treatments are extrapolated from adult data with little pediatric information. I think it's critically important that we get more data uh, in children and what the appropriate treatments are. We are, I think, being fairly aggressive with antiviral therapies with little information on its safety and efficacy. Uh, MISC is an evolving uh, pediatric specific problem. It does appear to be different from this hyperinflammatory lung disease ARDS that presents in adults. These children with MISC are more severely ill than the children with isolated lung disease. Most of them need ICU care, and there are uncertain long-term effects. So our major lesson learned, uh, preparation matters. Uh, Well-defined protocols for isolation and patient care are important. We spent a great deal of time beginning in January and early February planning for the possibility of COVID-19 coming into our area. And when it did arrive, we were well-prepared. We've continued to evolve our practices and policies as new information is available. Uh, initially, we weren't masking in the hospital. Now we've evolved towards universal masking. We've changed our procedures for indications for testing and for isolation for definition of PUI slightly as we've learned more information. And importantly, we've used simulation to train to local guidelines and protocols to train our staff to become very facile in managing care of patients with the burdens of the PPE. Multidisciplinary collaboration is essential. There are key roles for infectious disease, critical care, emergency medicine, general pediatrics, and hospital medicine. In preparation for the possibilities of severe illness, uh, special resuscitation precautions, intensive care, or critical care, and emergency medicine have been very important from a systems perspective in understanding how to manage critically ill patients, how to protect our non-COVID sick patients and how to manage airway and acute resuscitation interventions in this environment where there may be COVID. We are sharing and learning from information with peers internationally. Uh, you know, uh, in early February, there was very little literature out there about COVID-19. Now there is over 5,000 pa papers published. Uh, one of the challenges, so much is coming out and there's so much disparate information, it's going to be critically important that we learn together. And we are also responding to our local epidemiology. Uh, Seattle area was one of the first places in the United States to have an outbreak of COVID-19 in the community. Uh, our community responded very uh, quickly with um, care protocols, ramping up care capabilities, uh, social distancing in the community, and we saw a dip in the uh, prevalence, but now we're seeing an increase in our region, uh, and, um, uh, and that's also translating to an increased number of uh, pediatric uh, COVID-positive uh, children. 
So thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to share with you how we have approached uh, COVID-19. We are still learning together with all of you and uh, would be happy to uh, answer any questions or um, have discussion. Um, thank you very much, Dr. John McGuire. Um, I think your presentation has been done really, really well. And um, there are things from Seattle that we can borrow. Um, maybe I can allow Dr. Anne Marie to give us the, the Kenyan experience. Like what do we see um, in, in Kenya when it comes to our kids? Because she's the one on the ground. Dr. Thank you, Doc. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. McGuire, for an excellent presentation. I've been scribbling furiously as you've spoken. I think I'll just have to come back to your slides and recap and digest. So forgive me if as I speak, I'm just still gathering my thoughts. So I'll just share briefly our experience here in Kenya. Um, and I'm speaking mostly for Kenyatta National Hospital, which is our uh, largest national referral hospital, and McGathy Hospital, where we've set up um, an infectious disease unit for both pediatric and adult patients. So I think that as a country, we are sort of at the beginning of the epidemic, and our children have been largely shielded because after the initial uh, cases were announced officially, schools closed literally within a week. Um, and children have been at home and universal masking was introduced even for people in the community. So we have not really seen very many cases. So our initial policy was mandatory quarantine for um, anybody who was found to be positive. So between Kenyatta National Hospital and uh, Bagathi IDU, a total of 30 positive children aged from uh, the youngest I think I've had now is 22 days all the way to 19 years have been hospitalized between March um, and July. So 20 of these patients have actually been uh, patients who have had mild or no symptoms, just like you mentioned, maybe sore throat, uh, fever, myalgia, a bit of a runny nose. And many of these were actually patients who were uh, in mandatory quarantine with their parents uh, just because family groups were all being put together. Within the institution, um, we've had eight patients who have had severe illness. Um, majority of them have been aged between five and 10 years, uh, and they've, no, sorry, between one and five years, and they've all had an underlying illness. If I can just go through them, because there are not many, we've had an eight-year-old boy who had a B-cell lymphoma, a one-month-old baby with sepsis and acute kidney injury, uh, a child with newly diagnosed sickle cell disease. We have a little boy who's just about a year with a smooth, um, smooth muscle atrophy. So these are children who have been fairly sick even as they've been in hospital. Two of them have had cerebral palsy, so with underlying disorders. And what we've offered for them is just routine care uh, for the problem that they have presented with in hospital. And so far, our outcomes have been uh, good. We have lost two patients. One of them was a young child who was diagnosed early in the epidemic, um, was thought to have a malignancy, had traveled to India, and then came back and was admitted at our hospital. And the second one is a child who also had a dilated cardiomyopathy. So we're still trying to kind of develop the protocols. Um, I think you're very advanced in terms of your engineering controls because, for example, you're able to have the negative pressure, um, you're able to have all the airborne precautions, but even in our main hospital, and I can imagine and now that we've sort of opened up the country, even in our county uh, facilities, we may not have the luxury of having those sort of controls. So I think we're relying heavily on cohorting our suspects in one area and trying to treat our positive patients together and just really relying on good PPE uh, to keep our healthcare workers safe, as well as a good flu to kind of uh, prevent contamination and uh, transmission within the hospital to other patients and to healthcare workers. So regarding this, I had a couple of questions for you, Dr. McGuire. Um, I think expecting us to have negative pressure rooms um, and the sort of things you've mentioned is really going to be a tough call. 
two things you mentioned that were of interest to me. One, you said that you have had extended use for your masks. And I want you to just elaborate exactly what is this extended use? So um, we're, yeah, go ahead, uh, go ahead. Yes, no, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, two things. One is that uh, we recognize that uh, the negative flow room uh, option is not available at many places. We actually have a, a limited number of those rooms. And uh, if we had a large number of patients, we had a plan to set up a, uh, a, a unit that would not be all negative flow and to do exactly what you have recommended with cohorting, limiting traffic through that area and isolating based on, um, uh, on flow and on, on patient flow and, and staff flow. And that's how many hospitals in the United States that do not have uh, large numbers of negative flow rooms are managing. In New York City where they had uh, overwhelming numbers of patients, there was no way that those hospitals had enough uh, capacity for negative flow. So they had to do exactly what you identified with cohort. So the extended use mask process is because we, although we are better now for the number of masks available, we went through a period of time where we had significant shortage of masks. So what we do is we issue a person a, 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 a basic surgical mask and we use the face shield to kind of cover the mask on these plastic face shields to allow a person to wear a single mask for several hours in the day as long as it's not contaminated with the idea that um, it will keep the external surface of the mask or reduce this, the likelihood of the external surface of the mask from being uh, contaminated. Uh, several, uh, we are not using very many N95s, but uh, some hospitals have used where they take an N95 and the person wears the same N95 through the whole course of their shift. They may cover it with a simple mask to uh, prevent contamination of the mask. So these are strategies that we're using to conserve uh, PPE. Uh, the face shield strategy has been um, something that's been very helpful uh, for us. Okay, thank you very much for that. I also had a question regarding the specific um, treatment protocol. Um, I wanted first for anticoagulation. For what age of children are you giving um, anticoagulation while understanding that in children it's still fairly experimental? Uh, so the kids that we are giving anticoagulation to are the, the, uh, the, the kids with severe lung disease, uh, who are those who are in the ICU. We haven't had any actually intubated, but who've been on BiPAP. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of discussion early on about early intubation and whether patients with COVID should get intubated early to reduce uh, risk of exposure of staff to aerosolization and also because of concerns, particularly in the Italian elderly population, a very rapid progression of the lung disease. Uh, in our children, we have not seen the rapid deterioration. Uh, early on, we did have some kids that were similar to you that had significant underlying um, morbidities but we were able to manage them also with non-invasive positive pressure ventilation and avoid intubation. So, uh, but from an anticoagulation perspective, we are treating those severe kids. They've turned out to be mostly adolescent age and we have treated the uh, kids with the MISC with uh, anticoagulation. Again, there's not a great deal of data uh, supporting the risk of thrombosis in these children. We are extrapolating from the uh, adult data. Uh, the, um, uh, in our patients with MISC, uh, out of the seven, over half of them have had abnormal coronary artery dilation on echocardiogram. So they've been started on aspirin okay. for that, kind of extrapolating from Kawasaki disease treatment protocols. This area, I think, of question of anticoagulation in children is one that, that needs further study. And admittedly, we've been fairly aggressive with that without a lot of data on the actual risks. Thank you for that. Um, would you comment on the use of dexamethasone as well? We did give it to the seven-month-old Sickler who had severe pneumonia, but the child was also on antibiotics and other supportive therapy. So are you giving steroids to all the children with severe disease? We are now. Early on uh, in the first several cases, uh, now, I, I would say that, you know, we have not had a large number of, of patients, you know, similarly, Seattle 
did a lot of quarantining, closed schools early, and all the businesses, uh, except for essential businesses like hospitals and grocery stores and public safety related businesses uh, closed, and many of them are still closed here. Uh, so we did see a big reduction in the spreading in the community, but in our small number of um, uh, severe patients, early on it was a bit uh, 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 irregular. Kids were not routinely being started on steroids at the start, but for our, our kind of pneumonia patients coming in now, we've had uh, uh, several in the past month in this uptick of, of disease in Washington State. We are adding in dexamethasone to those patients that are requiring ICU level respiratory care and uh, treating them with that six milligrams a day protocol that was in the recent New England Journal of Medicine adult study. Again, not a lot of data in kids, uh, but we're extrapolating in part because these have been older children. Thank you very much, Dr. McGuire. Um, Nancy, I think you can take questions from the floor. Yeah, there's a variety have been in the, the Q&A chat. I could just go through some of those. There's some several excellent questions here. Uh, should I just go through those and then we'll see if there's, there's more? Uh, first one, are kids with IgG positive but COVID negative PCR results? Are they infectious to others? Are they still possibly shedding? I think that's a very good question. We've had a, several of these, a few of these kids in the hospital, some of our MISC kids that were IgG positive demonstrating they probably had infection exposure but were negative. To, uh, for these patients to be not in isolation, we are requiring uh, negative PCR from the nasal pharyngeal and from the sputum uh, from a lower respiratory tract. Now obtaining sputum in younger children is a bit challenging to know how effect how how adequate those samples are but we're still attempting and so we do believe that some of these kids uh, are uh, no longer shedding virus or no longer infectious. Now one of the things that's challenging is there's data that perhaps people have seen of patients with prolonged positivity by PCR with resolution of symptoms and uncertainty as to whether they are still shedding actively infectious virus. And that's a question that we don't have a, um, an answer to. But if we have a child who is IgG positive, but PCR negative from upper and lower respiratory tract, we will take them out of isolation. Uh, question, comment on whether you're using point of care ultrasound finding in pediatrics. Uh, we are increasingly using point of care ultrasound in our emergency department and in our ICUs for evaluation and management of critically ill children, uh, both evaluating for intravascular volume assessment, cardiovascular function, uh, pleural effusion. Uh, we are not doing a lot of point of care ultrasound evaluation of pneumonia yet. I know there's emerging data on that. Uh, I can't comment on to specific findings of point of care ultrasound in our patients, except that in our uh, patients with MISC who've had um, significant cardiovascular dysfunction, we would likely use point of care ultrasound at the bedside as kind of screening for their adequacy of heart function and then follow up with formal. Uh, echocardiogram for more um, careful evaluation. A uh, question from uh, Dr. Cabrera. Uh, what would be the best way of managing discordant pairs of mother and baby supposing one is COVID positive and the other negative? Considerations to make especially for the mother in terms of preventive measures, feeding, and treatment. Uh, discordant pairs. Um, the situation that we're uh, seeing is the mother's positive. We have not had a positive baby yet. We are following testing recommendations for infants of positive mother, testing them at, at 24 hours and then at, at 48 hours if they're going to be uh, in the hospital longer. If they're going to be discharged at less than 48 hours, they're just tested once. Uh, we are not testing babies if the COVID uh, status of the mother is negative. Uh, the uh, considerations for preventive measures, the, um, uh, similar to uh, the WHO protocols, we are uh, recommending that the baby uh, be uh, bathed and that the mother be washed and before the baby goes to the breast, breast that the mother's breast is washed and that the mother wear a mask during breastfeeding and during other care until she is asymptomatic. 
this is an evolving area, and I think there's some uh, extremely conservative recommendations from the uh, CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics, and uh, more data as to the uh, frequency of infection in the baby and uh, the um, uh, risk of infection in the uh, peripartum period will be important. Uh, as example, as, ev as, exam as uh, exemplified by one of the cases I showed, there are many other common reasons for respiratory distress in newborns at birth that are non-COVID related, such as that baby that had a small pneumothorax. Uh, another question from Dr. Cabrera, how could you explain recurrence of COVID-19 after discharging a patient to 52 weeks. Um, I'm not sure I understand that question. It was required a little bit more clarification. Um, so Dr. Uh, so from uh, Rumesa Akmal, uh, what has been the age distribution for our pediatric cases? Our pediatric cases have ranged from eight months up until 20 years of age. Anything in the data suggesting higher risk or greater susceptibility? Um, in our, uh, we are seeing more severe illness in our overweight uh, patients. Uh, I think that's definitely a case. We're also seeing higher severity in our children with underlying health problems, medically complex with uh, history of prematurity or underlying lung disease uh, or uh, other uh, medical uh, problems. Uh, what doses of aspirin and for how long? That's a very good question. We are giving uh, typically uh, Kawasaki protocol dosing uh, for patients with MISC and coronary abnormalities, so that's the higher dose. Other patients are getting the low dose, 81 milligrams. How long is a really good question. What we're doing is we're dosing them for a planned like two week course with evaluation uh, for follow up. For our patients who are getting anoxaparin anticoagulation, we are just treating them during the hospital stay and when they're ready for discharge, we're discontinuing it. Case of the adolescent child with severe disease and usage of remdesivir. Is there some positive feedback with usage of remdesivir and steroids combined? I think that's a good question. We don't have any specific data in our patients yet, and I think this will be something that we'll look to see from the adult data as there's more information. Uh, could you comment on their nutrition? Uh, we try to prioritize enteral nutrition in our uh, hospitalized patients. So if our children are sick and they're requiring non-invasive ventilation, if they're able to tolerate it, we would place a, a nasogastric feeding tube. A few of the children that we had that had underlying comorbidities that were fairly sick already had feeding tubes in place. They were children with existing gastric tubes or gastrojejunal tubes, and we were able to to feed them. So our goal would be to, to do uh, 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 enteral nutrition as soon as possible. Uh, are there any care, cases of recurrence? We have not had any evidence of reoccurrence in our patients. Um, comment on whether you delay birth vaccination for babies born to COVID positive moms. We have not. Uh, the uh, Babies who have been born to COVID positive moms, our neonatologists are recommending standard vaccination schedule. So the vaccine that they would get typically before leaving the hospital would be the hepatitis B vaccine. Uh, and they would then um, return uh, at their normal schedule for uh, other uh, vaccines. Uh, in the absence of, of negative pressure, is it possible to care for patients with appropriate distance between two beds in the PICU? That's a really good question. We have uh, gone in our hospital to all single patient rooms. It's a real challenge because we have several of our multi-bed rooms are now being used for one patient, which is really constraining our hospital capacity. While we're in the summer with low amount of other infectious disease and um, uh, without a, and with kind of reducing our surgical schedule that has been possible. But this is a big challenge in terms of how we're going to manage uh, patients uh, with um, distancing within the hospital and how we're going to, and we're discussing how we're going to use testing and isolation practices to keep everyone safe. Uh, could you uh, 
comment again on how you're conserving N95 masks. What we're doing is we're restricting N95 mask use to those situations where people have to enter a room emergently and don't have time to put on a, uh, a air purifying respirator. We've been very fortunate that we were uh, able to get a fairly good supply of the um, continuous air purifying respirator or CAPR helmets and have you been, used those, have been using those preferentially for uh, suspected or known COVID patients. Um, we uh, uh, have tried to limit the use of N95s to preserve our uh, supply. Um, home delivery and if you have any protocols to share. Uh, I don't have protocols for home delivery. Uh, we um, have a fair amount of that in Washington State and I'm not sure what is um, being done. I know that the uh, the, the CDC and the AAP uh, and the WHO have all made recommendations for how to manage uh, the environment and the cleaning of the baby and the bathing of the mother and the um, uh, bringing together of the mother and the baby. And also one of the key things that we are doing in the hospital and also recommending uh, for the home environment is limiting visitors uh, to the family. Uh, and in a situation, uh, the Canadian protocol, uh, they recommend restricting the um, COVID positive mother to only have contact with the baby because they are recommending rooming in. Side effects of dexamethasone in infants. That's a good question. I think uh, you know, dexamethasone in infants, our general experience is that it, has, it, it can have uh, hyperglycemia, uh, and hypertension and irritability as side effects. We have fortunately not seen severe COVID illness in infants, so we actually haven't treated any, um, any infants with dexamethasone. Uh, there's an argument that HIV positive patients on ARVs have a low risk of contracting COVID-19. Uh, I would say that I, I don't have the expertise to uh, address that question. Um, you know, we've talked about uh, uh, we don't have a, a large uh, number of HIV positive children in our, our population now. The uh, vertical transmission rate is uh, quite low in our community. So we, we uh, haven't really had an opportunity to discuss that uh, risk, but that's a super uh, important question. How is transmission of COVID-19 in children different from flu? Uh, we are treating the isolation practices very similar to influenza in that we use strict, strict uh, viral uh, or strict um, airborne precautions uh, for these patients, and we use a very similar approach to how we isolate influenza virus patients, and also with uh, special precautions around aerosol generating procedures such as airway management, suctioning of the of the uh, airway. We do consider use of uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation such as uh, uh, high flow nasal cannula and BiPAP as an aerosol generating procedure. In addition, any dental or otolaryngology uh, procedures. So we would, uh, in flu patients or in COVID-19 patients, we would use N95 or CAPR type precautions for those patients. This is a good question. Experience with false positive. If infants have one positive that's consequently two negative PCR testing, would you consider antibody testing? Uh, you know, we, um, we are uh, treating uh, all our positives as positive. Uh, we think that the test has high specificity. The question is more on sensitivity. Uh, if we would consider, uh, and if the person was initially positive and then asymptomatic with negatives times two, I think that we would probably consider that patient non-infectious, uh, although we would probably be cautious and recommend, if possible, still uh, quarantining. Uh, we would probably keep that patient in the hospital isolated if they were still needing hospitalization. And that would be a, in, a kind of a, a good discussion uh, if they were known positive during that period of time. Uh, antibody testing, I think that we are reserving antibody testing for our sick patients who have evidence of disease that might be linked to COVID, but who have negative PCR. So we are not routinely testing most patients with antibody. What is your experience with false positive testing amongst pediatric patients? Fairly low, uh, we think. And that's based on um, uh, information from our lab that feels that our testing is very high specificity. Uh, what stage of baby is most vulnerable in COVID positive? 
Uh, this is a good question. You know, there's uh, emerging data, I think very limited data and conflicting data on the risk to newborns. Uh, in hearing from our, our neonatologists, uh, they believe that the, in healthy babies that the risk is actually probably uh, quite low. Uh, how common is asymptomatic kids? Uh, our testing shows that in our, uh, amongst our children testing positive, 27% had no symptoms. So the, but the uh, majority of people who are asymptomatic, almost all of them, uh, less than half a percent were positive. So people who are asymptomatic are likely negative, but amongst the people who are positive, a fairly high percentage are asymptomatic. And this is a, consistent with what I've seen in uh, reports in adult populations and various studies showing that 20 to 40 percent of the infected people may be asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic. Have we had any preterm babies of COVID positive moms? We have not. Uh, we've had very few babies born to COVID positive mothers. None of the babies have tested positive. Uh, a couple have been sick, but they have been sick related to non-COVID related problems. Question is, is there any correlation between blood groups and COVID susceptibility? I don't have any information on that. I think that's a good question. Uh, the COVID, uh, overcoming COVID-19 registry that we're participating in, uh, we are submitting all the, the data on our patients uh, to the Centers for Disease Control along with um, uh, over um, uh, 30 other institutions providing comprehensive in-depth data. Uh, and uh, with the um, Remdesivir treatments, we're getting a lot of immune uh, data as well. So that'll give us a, a lot of opportunity to gain more information about susceptibility. So I think that, that these uh, type of data will be coming from pediatric patients in the coming months as we gain more experience. Us, like you, have had not very many severe cases, and that's true of most uh, pediatric institutions around the country and around the world. So I think it's going to be essential for us to share our data and share information and pool our, um, our knowledge. Given the relatively low asymptomatic COVID-19 population, children, do you have any thoughts and recommendations for return to face-to-face -face school? Oh, this is a super good question and it is creating a lot of uh, discussion and controversy in the United States right now and I imagine around the world. Um, it would be really nice to figure out a way, I think, from my personal opinion, to safely return kids to school. I think it's super important for their social development, for their appropriate learning. Uh, our school system in the Seattle area has not yet made a decision. Uh, I think that this is something that we're gonna need uh, more information on in terms of how, uh, how prevalent the uh, infection is in the community, what the risks are uh, of infection, and what effective me measures may be able to be taken to reduce the, um, the spread. As everybody knows, school location is often a very high frequency spreading for respiratory viruses in general. So I think this is, uh, uh, I wish I knew a, a good answer to this, but this is being uh, heavily debated uh, in, the, um, in the country and around the world now. Um, thank you very much, Dr. John McQuire, um, for even going through all the questions and answering them. Um, and, and that has provided a lot of insight, I think, to all of us. And I think um, the one question that I would like to ask, and maybe Dr. Anne-Marie would go first, then we can hear the Seattle experience. And it's a question from Judy Mash Mashuka. In terms of the, the psychological care that we are giving to our children and adolescents. Um, COVID-19 is here with us. And right now, all the children are probably at home and the COVID positive are being brought to hospital and being isolated. So are we giving any psychological care, mental health care to these children? Do they need it? Or, um, what, what would be your take on it? Um, thank you, Doc. I can speak for the children who have been hospitalized, especially the ones who were well and in Bagathi, because a large proportion of those were older children. Yes, they did have sessions with counselors um, 
and I think by the end of the quarantine period, at least those children had received the support that they required. And for the younger patients who we've had in hospital, we've had to provide a lot of support to the parents because this is still a highly stigmatized diagnosis. For the larger Kenyan population, I agree that there is so much that needs to be done for the children. I have seen a few private organizations trying to come up with ways of um, reaching out to children who are now going to be home until January, but I don't know that how that will be rolled out like on a countrywide level. But there are resources like on the WHO website, very good resources that parents can use um, just to talk their children through uh, questions about COVID um, and even suggested activities for them to do in the homes, because I think, again, that is uh, a challenge everywhere. Yeah, I think Dr. Mashuka uh, asked a very important question, and thank you, uh, Dr. Macharyo. We've struggled with this in the hospital for the children who are hospitalized because of the isolation practices and limiting of visitors. This is affecting our hospital as a whole, not, you, not just the COVID-19 infected children, which are actually a very small number of patients. Um, we uh, have limited of only, uh, well, we were for a while, we only allowed one caregiver to be in a room at a time, and we now allow two, but only two people, two family members uh, or caregivers per child can be registered in the system. So grandparents can't come, no sibling visits. So these children who have to be in the hospital for a while are isolated from their families. We are, um, for the COVID-19 positive children, they don't get to have the other like child life and play therapy people come into the room because we're limiting exposure. So this is super challenging. We are working on support systems like similar to what Dr. Macharya said to try to support these families uh, who are in this situation to have, you know, in terms of like bringing food to the room because the parents can't go in and out when they have a COVID-19 positive child in the hospital because they may, they're presumed to be exposed. We are allowing family members to be, you know, present with those those kids. Uh, in the community, this is a real challenge. Uh, similar to what you identified, you know, the, the school systems, the community is trying to provide opportunities to keep kids entertained. We have seen an increase in mental health admissions for our uh, community in, in children. This is um, creating significant stress on the community, obviously on the, the families, because many um, people aren't working, schools are out, and there's a lot of uh, stress in the community. So I think this is something that is very important for us to uh, address and be aware that this um, prolonged period of isolation is likely to have significant negative uh, mental health impacts on uh, both adults and children. And um, uh, keeping the kids isolated, of course, is taking them out of a very important um, normal developmental experience of interacting with, uh, with their uh, other you know, children peers. So another question, are children who have recovered from COVID-19 being followed up to identify any long-term complications? Uh, if so, what complications have been observed so far? We are tracking these kids. Uh, we are, um, as part of uh, the uh, uh, CDC registry uh, process and kind of evolving from one of the studies that we were doing with influenza, our infectious uh, disease team is uh, following these patients with um, follow-up phone call uh, surveys to see uh, what the natural history of this is over time. We do not yet have any uh, information on complications. Uh, our, I think it's gonna be uh, very interesting to see what happens long-term with the uh, uh, MISC patients. The few who we've had from May that have had follow-up visits uh, look to be doing well so far. Uh, one of them that had coronary artery dilation and significant cardiac dysfunction at several weeks after hospitalization was seen by cardiology follow-up and had normalized their heart function. Uh, so that's um, that's encouraging, but I think there's still very small numbers, so we don't yet know what the uh, long-term um, uh, follow-up concerns may be. We'll learn together. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Mugwaya. Um, I'd like to give a few a chance to a few people to ask their questions for the people who raised their hands. Dr. Grace Akech and Mushiri. Nyamache, kindly unmute yourself and ask your questions. Um, okay, 
So thank you very, very much for this presentation and, and, and also for like going through all the questions and answering um, the questions that have been presented. Um, so what would be your parting shot in terms of the management of children during this season while in hospital, while at home? What, what, what are your parting shots even as we come to the end of the session? Uh, I'll ask one last, I mean, there's one last question, I'll answer that and then it's, uh, and then I'll ask, I'll answer your question. It says, on use of PPE, what kind of masks are general population using? The recommendations in the community are to wear cloth masks uh, and to uh, reserve uh, kind of surgical or hospital type masks for the healthcare population. Uh, are there exemptions for children regarding use of masks in terms of age? The, the recommendations in the community are that children under two years of age do not have to wear a mask or if uh, any age has a problem with uh, health conditions that might affect their ability to breathe well with a, a mask, such as like uh, severe lung disease, uh, although that's uh, um, quite subjective. Uh, how would you handle twins where one is positive, one is negative inpatient? That's a very good question. Um, uh, I, we have not had any positive babies. Uh, I think that we would probably go through recommendations and, and I, I think our neonatologists would recommend uh, separation or isolation of the negative baby to prevent uh, infection. Although the, um, as discussed earlier, the actual risks uh, of infection and severity are, are still uncertain. So kind of parting shots. I think that uh, 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 COVID is gonna be with us for a long time, I think. Uh, you know, we are hopeful for uh, development of a vaccine, but the timeline on that will likely be long and it'd be uncertain whether we're gonna have a um, effective vaccine in any time soon. So I think it's important from a healthcare perspective that we develop uh, protocols and policies to help manage our environment, take care, safe care of our patients, support the children and their families, and uh, ensure safety for our staff. And I think it's important that we evolve these as more information becomes available. As I mentioned earlier, there's a small number of pediatric patients in any single location. So we'll have to compare our data across, uh, across the country, across the world. We'll have to uh, uh, develop opportunities to study uh, effectiveness of treatments and evaluate outcomes in relation to uh, different severities of disease, different disease manifestations. So I think that uh, the um, communication and collaboration of the international pediatric community is essential. And um, I've been very fortunate to learn from my colleagues around the country and around the world early on uh, with uh, information from the early outbreaks in uh, Italy, Spain, China. Uh, and I think that the uh, uh, you know, opportunities like this for us to share our experience are super helpful. So I really appreciate the opportunity to share our perspectives from uh, Seattle and um, to learn of what you're doing in uh, Nairobi. And I look forward to hearing more uh, as we go forward from, uh, from you all and from our colleagues around the world. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Maguire. I'd like to give um, Dr. Anne-Marie also a chance to give us her parting shot, even as we come to the end of this session. Thank you, Dr. Maguire, for an excellent presentation. And I think the participation was great. I've learned a lot. Um, and a lot of food for thought as we continue to develop our local protocols. Um, I can see a lot of my colleagues on board and for me it's that I think we should also just ensure that our regular pediatric services are running. I think we're going to have a lot of problems from interruption of things like our immunizations and other chronic care clinics so that even as we manage COVID we manage our children wholesomely across the board. Thank you. Um, thank you very much um, to Dr. Maguire and Dr. Anne-Marie for the really, really excellent presentation and for um, the protocols that have been shared and uh, for answering our questions. Um, uh, thank you so, so much also to all of the people who've attended this session. It's late in Nairobi. It's, uh, it's currently 8.16 p.m. And thank you so much for taking your time to actually attend the session and, and, and learn what we can do for our pediatric population during this time. And um, to our host, Dr. John Kinukia, thank you very much. Um, 
I think we've come to the end of this session. Thank you very much. Um, for queries about CPD, kindly email us at knhcpd at gmail.com. Have a good night for the people in Kenya and good morning to Dr. John McGuire and the people in Seattle. Thank you. Thank you so much. I truly enjoyed the opportunity to share and discuss and learn. Thank you all.